Good morning, everyone. I know we are just on top of 1115. Um, I'm sure there are folks who are going to start coming in, but two minutes ago things started to get very quiet after the, the, the chimes, so I thought I would go ahead and get, get started. Um, my name is Beth Namachevaya. I am here on behalf of um, the project team uh, that was funded by uh, the Institute of Museum and Library Services um, to host a national forum uh, on text data mining research using in copyright and use limited text data sets. That forum happened last week in Chicago um, and in the room today with us there are at least a couple of participants who were there at the one and a half day forum uh, so I'm going to ask my my colleagues um, if you have input that you would like to um, to add please feel free I would welcome that so when we proposed this idea for the forum we identified several stakeholder groups that we felt really needed to come together at this forum to talk about the challenges and also the way forward to facilitate text data mining within copyright and licensed text <coughs> so our goal was to situate and I'm going to call it TDM for short uh, which is to situate TDM support and education and conversations by academic libraries within a broader landscape because we felt that TDM really really appeared as though it were a a niche activity uh, something that was really done um, by uh, very you know real erudite group who were both technically savvy um, and also had the the um, the wherewithal to um, to work out not only the technical problems but to also work through the methods um, that were necessary to uh, to successfully do text data mining and then incorporate that in into your research so we really wanted to set, situate TDM within a much broader landscape within research libraries we wanted to articulate points of convergence and divergence among the stakeholder groups and we wanted to develop a strategy for libraries to expand research data services to include support frameworks for text data mining. We also wanted to leverage partnerships that libraries uh, could and have been forging with researchers, professional and scholarly organizations, and the legal community to support more open and accessible TDM. We felt that that was really a necessary part of what we were going to pursue together. So as you can see, the attendees at the meeting represented a really impressive scope and depth of expertise. We brought together researchers who are at the heart of text data mining, librarians, content providers, and this included both commercial and, um, and openly accessible content providers. We brought together legal experts, and that included practitioners, both in libraries and in the broader academic uh, legal um, networks. And we also brought together legal researchers in these groups. And then we brought together um, representatives from professional associations, organizations that advocate in the space of research and networked information, like CNI. <clears throat> Professional Association members included um, a representative from the National Academy of Sciences, ARL, ACRL, um, BERTI, the Board of Research Data and Information, um, and, and all in all, we identified a team of 25 experts in this area who met, as I mentioned, last week in Chicago. So with these questions framing the work that we did, the project team set out throughout the fall and winter of 2017 and 18, and we worked on two things, a scoping literature review that formed the foundation of a pre-forum discussion paper, and we worked simultaneously with the project participants to explore their perspectives on the landscape of TDM. 
We asked them to develop SWOT analyses. We did individual interviews with them. And just prior to the forum, we asked them to write forum statements. So the forum attendees were really a diverse group. They had a wide range of ideas and opinions. So when we entered the room last week, there was one statement that we all agreed on at the start of the forum, and that was the fact that copyright law and resource licensing complicate research with text data. So we started from that point of reference and we worked forward. We also wanted to make sure that we framed a definition of TDM. And really, we defined it as computational processes for applying structure to unstructured electronic texts and, and employing statistical methods to discover new information and reveal patterns in that process data. <coughs> These data might include electronic journal articles, newspapers, books, or more informal textual data, data such as consumer reviews or blog posts. In scoping the project, we set aside numeric data, non-textual content, uh, such as static images, audio, or video. We got a lot of pushback about that throughout the process of the forum. And this was a really interesting tension um, that, that we needed to explore, not only with the attendees, but as we scoped the National Forum proposal and worked with IMLS and got feedback from the proposal reviewers who suggested we want you to narrow this. We want you to really focus on text. And then as we got to the forum, um, folks in the forum said, you know, there were really relationships between what happens in TDM and what happens with mining and, and analyzing other media. So we, we understand and we feel that this is really an important backdrop for what, what happens in this space going forward. So we also struggled with something else, and that was, was with what to call this data. Um, we, we finally came to terms with this, um, and we called it use-limited data. Um, you know, coming to terms with it, the intellectual property dimensions was really difficult for us. Um, in the early proposal development, ref we referred to these data as IP restricted. We found that term sort of hindered rather than facilitated our discussion with stakeholders. And as we submitted the proposal, we settled on limited access. We didn't really feel that encompassed the full spectrum of challenges that scholars face throughout the research life cycle when they're trying to work with these data. So that's how we came to grips with talking about use-limited data. We feel that that better describes the more restrictive facet of research with these data, how they may be used, and it encompasses a spectrum of activities ranging from modes of access to redistribution for validation and reuse. So we did use several methods, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, one was the scoping review of the literature. That was a targeted review of scholarship um, on issues relating to mining texts that are under copyright, subject to licensing agreements or otherwise restricted due to intellectual property. We looked at works primarily in English for the past 17 years. We focused primarily on the U.S., but the team also included scholarship that addressed other legal jurisdictions, including Canada, Australia, the UK and the European Union. Um, we did searches on prominent databases in using terms related to law, library and information science, computer science, linguistics, e-science, digital humanities, and computational social science. We also did interviews with each of the forum participants. We reviewed the notes and the interview transcripts and we identified prominent themes. You might say that we did a lot of mining of the, the input that we got from the participants. We also mined um, SWOT analyses that we asked the participants to do. Um, we asked them to look at and articulate very succinctly the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in this space. 
We also ask them to develop a, a forum statement, a very brief and succinct one to two page statement about what they felt was important that needed to happen in this area to make TDM more accessible. And another, it's not a method, but I, I feel like I, I, I want to call your attention to something that we used to really facilitate conversations and, and sort of action-focused work at the forum. And that was a, um, a framework called Liberating Structures. If you Google Liberating Structures on the web, uh, you'll find a website which I understand is cribbed from a publication, very largely from another um, publication, that essentially um, provides some really good ideas for eliciting input from groups and um, essentially getting, getting groups to interact with each other, but also to, to focus on the things, the, the places where you want to go. I want to talk a little more about the SWOT analysis because I lived and breathed with it for a couple of weeks all by myself in my apartment. <laughs> and um, I identified a number of themes coming out of this SWOT analysis, but I did something um, that I thought uh, was really helpful. Each attendee did a SWOT analysis. I coded those according to these themes, but I also coded them according to what stakeholder group they represented. And then I took the information that, that fell under each of the themes, regardless of which stakeholder group, and I, I combined all of that information. So under a theme, I could see comments on strengths, weakness, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats from all of these stakeholders together. Um, so mining that, I, I wanted to talk about a couple of, of themes that really jumped out, and they jumped out of the SWOT analysis across these groups. There's tension over um, working with content and, and the research process of working with content. Um, there are differences of opinion among researchers, librarians, and content providers about the best ways to provide access to use-restricted data. Okay, that's a no-brainer. Um, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. All of these groups shared the concern that there, there really isn't a shared terminology across the disciplinary and professional boundaries. There are ad hoc procedures for transferring data, uneven data quality, idiosyncratic use of data formats among content providers. All of these things really hinder greater access to and deeper analysis of these data. So there was a lot of shared concern over this. Practices to providing access to these data are all over the map, and everybody to a person agreed that that really doesn't make sense if we want to promote this research. Um, even well-resourced universities struggle to provide access to content that has been delivered, say, on a firewire drive that shows up in the library with the caveat, make sure you destroy this after you've done your research with it and don't redistribute it. We also noticed that there is a chilling effect of use restrictions in TDM research. Um, those folks who said that researchers continue to do work with use, restriction, re use restricted data, but they don't openly communicate their methods and their data sources. Um, we're also in this, this sort of rough area where um, researchers um, really don't have a way to communicate how other researchers could replicate or repurpose the findings that they have from their research. Um, and I think this is, this is one of the things that, that everyone agreed was probably a, a significant obstacle to um, TDM uh, being um, TDM uptake uh, throughout the disciplines. There were a number of legal and policy issues uh, that were pointed out. It is not surprising, um, I'm sure you will not be surprised by the fact that this theme was the most commented on across all of the stakeholder groups. In the United States, the Fair Use Agreement for Text Binding frequently is grounded on the concept of non-consumptive research. 
which although it was defined in 2010 um, in the rejected settlement agreement in the Authors Guild versus Google, in practice it's more complicated than it first appears. The boundaries between consumptive use and non-consumptive research are really not well developed. The line between checking results, which is permissible in, say, the Google Books decision, and that line between doing that and human reading is not a bright line. And often, that is the thing that researchers want to do. They want to look at the summative results that come out of running algorithms across uh, one or more text corpora, and then they want to go back and read portions of that and really more deeply understand what they're doing. There was also some interesting conversation and tension around business models. Um, there's tension about the, the role of commercialization in the text mining services. Some fear that if they haven't already, universities are going to lose ground to large corporations such as Google, who will serve as data brokers for researchers instead of libraries. Others noted that publishers' interest in data mining extends beyond building TDM platforms and provisioning data access, but also to mining journal content for internal business purposes. Some folks noted that licensed data sets are a source of economic viability. This is a way to extend a thriving publishing industry, while a number of stakeholders are concerned about further monetizing access for, mon for mining purposes. So what were some of our outcomes? Um, one of the areas around which there was a pretty broad consensus at the end of a day and a half of conversation um, and thinking both as a group of the whole but also thinking in small groups and, and um, working through some of the tensions that exist among uh, stakeholder groups. We all came to this conclusion that um, TDM is really part of a larger conversation. It's really, if you think about the library's role, about libraries making content more useful and more usable in the digital age. We struggled as a group around identifying words and phrases that would, that would elicit a pretty high comfort level across our stakeholder groups. We talked about, is this really about open access for data mining? And, and we realized that there isn't a, a strong comfort level across all of our stakeholder groups with talking about making everything open. But there was a comfort level with um, focusing on making content more useful and more usable in the research process. Um, building on that, there was a pretty good shared understanding that more useful and usable content really does mean it is accessible. And we need to figure out how to frame the conversations that, say, libraries have on behalf of researchers, or libraries and researchers and content providers have about figuring out how we really have conversations that, um, that express what it is a researcher wants to do, how it can be done, and then how it can be done within the context of working with use limited data um, without um, raising tensions that sometimes lead to, you know, a, a unilateral no, you can't, or um, you can only do this, but you can't do that. Um, we also um, realized that reading and content mining, as they were sort of outlined in, in that 2010 conversation about consumptive and non-consumptive research, these are really not mutually exclusive research activities for all researchers. And probably they're not mutually exclusive for most researchers. Because inevitably, if you see something in a summative that's re referred to or occurs in a summative way, you really want to dig in and understand, well, 
what is the context around that? You know, how can, I, how can I apply what I know about this body of research to these pointers in, in the, the non-consumptive research? And we also came to this realization that content mining can drive business models and revenue if we work on this and if we use it appropriately. Um, it, it doesn't mean, it doesn't uh, mean that content mining um, as a revenue generating activity needs to be necessarily an add-on to something that is already um, uh, fairly expensive and out of reach for a number of institutions and groups. So I mentioned at the beginning of the, um, the presentation that we were really geared toward making commitments and we were geared toward asking individuals to make commitments um, but we also worked um, in a very focused way on getting getting groups of people together not just according to their stakeholder groups but also giving them opportunities to talk across the stakeholder groups to identify things that they wanted to do things that were actually coming out of their conversations together so at the end of the um, at the the end of the um, one and a half days we had a number of activities that uh, groups are working on together. Uh, one group is working on a declaration uh, for principles around uh, text data mining. Um, another group is working on making recommendations for academic library services, um, uh, so a pragmatic approach. Um, another group is working on legal infrastructure for computational research. Um, yet another group is developing a grant proposal um, to develop uh, legal and intellectual property workshops for librarians and for researchers. Um, there is a group, uh, there are conversations happening around a pilot TDM uh, service working with Hathi Trust, Portico, Publishers, and Crossref. Um, there are more things happening, um, but uh, we were really um, quite uh, excited about the fact that um, there are a number of, of on-the-ground activities that working groups are, are pursuing um, and we're actually in the process of setting up Google Groups for them to continue to do this. Um, next steps in addition to that include a white paper which ACRL intends to publish this summer um, and I also wanted to extend an invitation. Um, if anyone wants to get involved, feel free to contact me. That's my email address. Um, we will set up a more general email box for folks who, um, who want to know more about the project. And in the beginning of the, on my first slide, uh, if I can page back to it, which I will in a moment, um, there is a link to the website for the project and we're going to use that to keep people informed. So I would like to break and um, take questions, comments um, from, from those in the audience. Yes, Robin. If, if you uh, want to get the URL for the project site, that is another way to um, to track on, on what's happening with the project going forward. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate your comments. <laughs>